Do you want to become a better reader of research? If so, you're in the right place. My name is Matt Tomitz, and I'm here to take you through the third video of my multi-part series on how to read research literature. In this video, I'm gonna talk all about the methods and results sections. The methods are important because that's what the researchers actually did, and consequently, how applicable is the study to your own situation, which goes back to the original purpose of reading the study in the first place. The results are important because that's how you evaluate what actually happened to determine if the study was successful or not, which goes back to the original purpose of the study itself. I'm gonna take you through my thought process and give you guys questions to ask yourself in reading these sections. As well, I'll give you guys my five by four brief summary chart on the main statistical tests that occur in research. The purpose of a method section is basically to map out everything they did from beginning to end if someone wanted to replicate it. This is going to include operational definitions, why they chose certain variables over others, what subjects they used, statistical analyses, and things like that. Things to ask yourself are, is there flow? Is there a logical sequence to it? Did they complete pilot data? Is there experimental control in the decisions that they made? And then bring it back into the overall context, right? The goal of this study is, how applicable is it to my own situation? The method section will give you insight into the decisions that the researchers made for the trade-off between internal and external validity internal validity being how well does the study set itself up to test what it's actually saying it will, or inside the study itself, the walls of the study, how well will it do? And external validity is how well outside the walls of the study, how applicable will the results be? Also, I like to say it as the trade-off between perfect data and real-world data, or the trade-off between what it takes to actually be published and what it takes to actually apply the results in the real world. Being a more informed consumer of research literature, using your critical thinking skills, taking notes while you read, you can figure out from the method section of every paper what you liked, what you didn't like, considerations that don't really apply to you, things you probably should start considering that you wouldn't have thought of otherwise. It's important to keep this concept in mind because just because the researchers did it one way doesn't mean that you have to do it the exact same way when it comes time to apply the results. So if you can figure out why the researchers made certain decisions, whether it was for internal validity or for external validity, you can realize how those line up with your own situation. So there's definitely value in every paper you read. The statistical analysis section is technically part of the methods where they just say what tests they're gonna do, but they're more related to the results, which we'll get into now. The purpose of a result section is to actually see what happened. You collect data, you analyze it, and then you make a conclusion based off those tests. Now, I'm not saying I'm an expert in stats or data or anything like that, but I think that stats are definitely a lot more complicated than people give credit for. I came up with this table during my graduate stats class that I believe does a pretty good job of summarizing the main statistical tests and kind of how to work through the tests when reading a results section of a paper. A t-test is where you compare the differences between two groups. A one-way t-test is comparing a group against a norm or a standard. So is this group of people getting eight hours of sleep? An independent t-test is where the two groups are independent of each other, such as boys versus girls and jump height. Now, a dependent or a paired t-test is where the two groups are related to each other. So if you were to do jump height for pre and post, so that's the two different groups of a group of athletes. The main number it spits out is the p-value, or was the difference significant? So normally this is set at 0.05, and a simple way to think about p-values is basically 95% statistically significant means that we're 95% sure that the difference seen did not happen by chance. So there's only a 5% chance that the differences happened kind of randomly. So that's a basic intro into p-values. How you can evaluate if the t-test itself was good, which you can assess for norm normality, effect size, power, that's a little bit more complicated. And the best way to visualize t-tests are by bar graphs. Now, ANOVAs is how you compare the differences between three groups. Now, a one-way ANOVA would be the difference between third, fourth, and fifth grade on jump height. A repeated measures ANOVA would be where the, the groups are related. So it would be time point one, time point two, and time point three on jump height throughout, let's say, a training cycle. And a univariate ANOVA would be basically thinking like a two by two square. So you have boys and girls, and then you have fourth and fifth grade. So you basically have four different groups, 
boys fourth grade, boys fifth grade, girls fourth grade, girls fifth grade, but you're testing them on one number, let's say jump height. So those are the three different types of ANOVAs. And an F ratio is gonna be the main value of basically were the groups different among themselves or not. You would want a big F ratio. So you'd want a big difference between the groups because that's what you're comparing. And then your p-value would basically say, are they statistically significant or not? You evaluate how good the ANOVA was by the post hoc tests. Now, an, an ANOVA and the F ratio doesn't say what groups were different between each other. They just say, was there a difference? And then in the post hoc test, that's where you figure out what groups specifically were different from one another. Eta squared is just a, basically an effect size, but for an ANOVA, how big was the difference? And you would display this on a bar graph. Now, correlation is basically the association or relationship of two groups. How related are they to e each other? When one goes up, does the other go up? When one goes down, does the other go down? When one goes down, does the other go up? And things like that. Now, this is probably the test you guys are more most familiar with, but R value, how correlated are each other? And a P value is basically how significant is that relationship or not? R squared, or the amount of explained variance, so let's say your R was 0 0.7, your R squared would be 0 0.49. So that means that between with those two variables, one can explain 49% of the variance in the other one. This sounds a little bit more complicated than it is, but that's just how you analyze really how strong that R value is. And you would display this on a scatter plot. Regression is basically how well one variable or multiple variables can predict the other variable. So for example, it would be if I have your height and your weight, can I predict how high you can jump? Now this is a little bit more complicated because there's a lot of moving pieces and you can have one variable going to regression or you can have multiple, but you would look at the unstandardized, uh, so you'd look at the R value, so the correlations of all of the variables to the main variable. You would look to see if those variables themselves are statistically significant, and you would look at the unstandardized coefficients and intercepts, basically what goes into the actual regression equation. You look at R squared to see how much variance it explains and standardized co coefficients, those are pretty similar basically saying how well are the is the regression doing at predicting and that would be on a scatter plot as well so very brief but just having a basic understanding of what these mean when you would use them in different like what do they answer the differences between the main number you're going to be looking for how to evaluate if it was a good test or not how well it does and basically, if they are to visualize it, how would they do it? So by no means was it anything complex, but I think that'll give you a pretty good foundation on just having a more general understanding of the four main types of tests and how to evaluate the tests themselves. So questions you can ask yourself when reading the results section are, did they pick the right test? And are they reporting the numbers correctly based on the tests? But that ties into the discussion conclusion, which is for the next video. As always, you can get all the gear I use on Amazon, link in the description. Please subscribe if you want to stay up to date with my content. Please like the video if you like the video and comment down below for feedback on what you want to see next.